Hello, y'all. Welcome to the Spot Robotics Podcast. Today, I'm joined by guest Mr. Ace Moore, discussing cybersecurity and software engineering. I hope you enjoy this podcast where you can gain insights into technology developments in the modern world and gain a new perspective and advice on how to succeed in these fields. If you enjoyed the podcast, make sure to follow us on wherever you get your podcast. And if you'd like to support us even more, make sure to give us a review. Thank you and enjoy. So for my first question, I want to ask basically, um, what do you do and what your day-to-day activities look like and what career field are you in? Um, hi, uh, my name is Ace Moore. Uh, I am a senior engineer for a healthcare company. Um, so I'm the technical lead on my team. My team uh, primarily is uh, focused on threat intelligence. We fall under uh, un- the umbrella which is called cyber defense operations. Uh, so essentially what's under that umbrella is my side of the house, which is threat intelligence, and then uh, vulnerability management. Uh, what was your second question? My second question was like some of your day, day-to-day activities that you do in your job. Uh, day-to-day, well, overall, uh, the purpose of my role and my team is uh, we are the ones who essentially uh, make sure that all of our security control owners and everyone within our SOC, which is a uh, security operations center, are aware of emerging threats. Uh, we try to make sure that we are getting ahead of the curve um, on specific threats that might be detrimental to uh, our company's assets or our environment. Um, we kind of keep our ears uh, to the ground and we call it, we say eyes on glass. Um, of various nation state threat actors because we're a global company. So we have presence in a bunch of different countries around the world. Um, And there's obviously conflict uh, around the world that might impact our business. And so um, what we generally do or what my job is uh, to do is to essentially evaluate all these threats, um, provide vulnerability intelligence to our specific team so that they can make control adjustments so that we are able to protect the information uh, of our uh, business partners as well as um, just internal information overall. That's that's real interesting. Um, my next question was: uh, So you're basically you say you're a cybersecurity professor at Collin College. And I want to ask, um, what really led you to become like? What, what was your motivation to to pursue teaching and? How do you think that the cyber, like with all this teaching and cybersecurity, how do you think that would impact, how is it going to impact the future? Uh, So you're curious about how I got into teaching and how cybersecurity uh, will impact the future? Yeah. Is that your question? Uh Uh, So I got into teaching. I had a friend um, who was a teacher. She taught at Georgia State uh, or Georgia Tech, actually. and she told me about it. I had just finished up my master's degree. I was working in, um, you know, the industry. Uh, I was early on. I was about maybe two years in the industry. Uh, not a lot of people in my industry have their master's. And so um, I got my master's degree. Um, me and her were conversing. And she was telling me, she was like, yeah, I'm a professor. I was like, oh, how'd you get into this? She was like, just apply. And so I was like, okay. Um, so just the knowledge of knowing that there are professors and schools and programs that don't have people that work in the industry to teach the stuff that we do, it made sense. And so I started just applying to different, a bunch of different schools and I was getting a lot of callbacks and it was like, Hey, can you come on as an adjunct? Um, and I was like, yeah, sure. So I, I was started teaching at a bunch of different schools and I kind of fell in love with it. Uh, I have a true knack for kind of just talking, <laughs> uh, you know, about just random stuff. Um, but when there's kind of like a curriculum that I have to follow and, you know, it's stuff that I actually do day to day, then it makes it so much more easier for me to kind of converse. It's like every class I have is like I'm having a conversation with uh, all of my students. Um, so it's, it's been a, it's been a while right? uh, over the last three years. I think I've been teaching for maybe three or four years now. Um, it's been fun. Uh, it's been rewarding, um, you know, teaching people, uh, you know, up and coming engineers, people that will, you know, be in my position uh, in the future has is, is been awesome. Uh, I always try to, you know, make sure that I put a little bit more effort towards minorities, um, people that look like me, uh, people that look like you, uh, women specifically, uh, you know, just to kind of change 
you know, just what cybersecurity looks like from an overall image perspective as well. Uh, so I put a lot of effort into that uh, specifically when I'm, uh, you know, teaching my classes and courses. Um, and your second question was uh, how cybersecurity will be impacted or will change in the future. Is that what you asked? Uh, how, how will it be changed in the future with like, like the increase, like like the amount of schools that are now teaching cybersecurity compared to like 10 years ago? How do you think it will be changed overall? Um, I think, well, institutions, educational institutions are a business. Um, and so they're going to implement programs that businesses are looking to hire people for. Um, so, you know, you're always going to need doctors. You're always going to need lawyers. You're always going to need, you know, nurses, things of that nature. So those programs are always solidified for like, forever. Um, cybersecurity is, I probably believe, or more so computer science or anything of that nature, is probably going to be in that realm over the next couple of years because as we move more and more into digital space, uh, we'll start seeing a lot more schools offering cybersecurity focused programs uh, to kind of, you know, entice people to go to their school or enroll into their school. Uh, so I feel as though that that's probably just the next frontier is we'll probably start seeing a lot of bigger name schools um, catering to cybersecurity a lot more in the future. Um, so a lot of, you know, Syracuse's, Harvard's, things of that nature. Um, we'll, we'll start seeing a lot, a lot of those big, big schools kind of, if not already, um, really putting, pushing those programs and putting money towards those programs going forward. That's, that's really interesting. Uh, so my next question was, and it's kind of related to like the, the technologies that are like emerging today. I want to ask like with the generative AI and the increase of AI technology overall, and how it's like, how like efficient it is and like realistic. How do you think that's impacting the cyberspace as a whole? And like, if, if possible, is it like impacting you right now and like as being like a cybersecurity person? Uh, yeah, for sure. I think it's uh, it's kind of a, a, a two-faced coin uh, is how I view it. Um, AI and uh, generative technology, generative AI, uh, a lot of that stuff is uh, useful for um, a defensive standpoint. So people on my side of the, of the field where we're, you know, defending against these attackers and whatnot, um, you know, it helps us to do our job a lot faster. And a lot of mundane tasks are kind of, uh, you know, solved just using AI and things of that nature. Um, but it also helps to mature threat actors' uh, ability to attack a lot better as well, too. Um, you know, oftentimes you see uh, for a very minor, small, non-technical example, I would say is, uh, you know, uh, you, you would get a phishing email in the past where, uh, you know, you could tell that the English was kind of broken in some capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, now threat actors could potentially have, you know, chat GPT to create just a script for them to use for their, um, for their phishing email. And it makes it a lot more believable. Uh, you know, even if they don't speak, you know, real full blown English, whoever's on the attacker side, um, they can use chat GPT to kind of create those scripts for those phishing emails, make it a lot more believable. And, you know, anything that's believable can, you know, be clicked. And so, uh, you know, it's a two faced token from both sides, from a defensive and offensive standpoint of security. Um, I do believe that uh, it's helpful from a defensive standpoint. We got a lot of different tools that are coming out. Uh, a lot of enhancements to a lot of different tools that's making a lot of making it really easy for us to kind of detect defend um you know and put our focus towards a lot more stuff that ai is unable to actually do um so i believe it's uh you know it's it's, it's, it's great and you know just as far as any innovation uh people find it you know uh scary at first but uh you know the fear of the unknown is always something that we always got to overcome uh, just like with any technology that's uh, come out in, in the past. I had a, a little like a side question based on what you said. Um, so I want to ask, like, I don't know if this relates to cybersecurity in particular, but like with the, with like generative AI and like AI technologies, uh, and like the spread of misinformation as a whole. Do you think like for like big companies like you're part of like a like a company with like health related to healthcare, which like information as a whole could like completely change like a person as like together do you think like with the growth of misinformation as a whole that 
there'll be intense focus on like cybersecurity or like related fields? Um, can you rephrase your question for me? <clears throat> uh, my question was basically like with the growth of misinformation with like AI, do you think that there'll be a heavy emphasis on like the like in the industry on like having like more cybersecurity people? Yeah, absolutely, definitely. Um, I think misinformation is a that's that's an area of public relations. I think um, oftentimes we come across uh, different posts. You know, social media is kind of where kind of the the, the vehicle for misinformation quite a bit. Uh, so it's kind of it kind of becomes a uh, PR thing uh, more than it's a cybersecurity thing. I would say um, just managing the actual information that you know is put into the world uh, is generally kind of necessary for uh, you know I would say cybersecurity professionals too uh, to kind of you know be aware of what is actually out there and making sure that. Um, we're not, you know, misinterpreting things and, you know, putting our energy towards or using bandwidth towards things that might not be of, uh, importance to, you know, your business or your company. Um, you also kind of, it's kind of just like finding a needle in a haystack, uh, nowadays, uh, simply because, you know, it's so many, so much noise, uh, on the internet, you got so many different avenues and streams. You got like Reddit, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, everyone's using all these different things um, to basically, you know, get news and get information. Um, and, you know, it causes like an uproar in society quite a bit. Um, and, you know, it's, there, there's a creation of a bunch of different tools and uh, different things that's added on to a lot of these websites uh, that people are using where they're getting this misinformation to kind of correct it. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, from a cybersecurity standpoint, it kind of helps us out. Uh, and I think it will kind of affect us in a, a bit. But I think it's more so just uh, public opinion is where misinformation really is uh, taking, you know, taking a full blown, um, you know, uh, it's, it's really detrimental towards. That's in my opinion. So. Gotcha. Uh, so my, for the next question was, uh what like what field in particular? I know we talk about AI. Like like what field in particular in the cybersecurity space as a whole have you been seeing that's been getting a lot of traction lately? And for the people who don't know, could you explain that specific sure, field sure. in general? Yeah, uh, I think architecture is uh, security. Architecture is a really uh, big space that's opening up a lot more because you got a lot of these organizations who are trying to. Uh, become a lot more innovative, uh, but also enhance their security posture. Um, and you can't just say, hey, I want to add this tool into my environment. You need someone who kind of like, kind of got to know how to deploy that tool, put it in the right place, um, you know, make sure that it's monitoring certain assets and whatnot. So uh, as a lot of these organizations try to become a lot more security focused, you need someone to build out these solutions. Uh, security architects are the ones that build out these solutions. So that's a pretty big space that's uh, going to be booming over the next couple of years. I would also say cloud security space. Um, that's another another huge area that's growing uh, due to the fact that a lot of uh, organizations are moving all the information from on-premise, meaning uh, having stuff in like servers that they maintain uh, on site at their organization onto like a cloud environment that's maintained by like a cloud service provider. Um, and you need people to secure these things. And so, um, you know, cloud security and security architecture are probably going to be the next two biggest areas uh, of positions that are going to be super needed um, in this in this field. Mm -hmm. uh, my next question was, um, so I want to ask, like, what led you to pursue a career in cybersecurity? Because, like you said, you mentioned, like, back in the day, there wasn't much, like, mm -hmm. heavy, I mean, there's still a little bit, like, not as much as there was today of like heavy focus on cybersecurity. So like, what led you really yeah. go into like emerging field in general? Uh, I think, well, I was always a tinkerer when I was younger. So uh, I, I distinctly remember getting like my first, well, my family getting our first computer was a compact computer. 
uh, you might not remember how they used to look, but they had the, it was a huge little modem or like a uh, hard drive at the CD-ROM. You put like CDs in there, DVDs. Um, then uh, we had a monitor that came with it as well too, huge, like a bubble back monitor. Uh, so we had one of those in my, and we kept it in my parents' room. And I would always just go in there and just tinker, uh, you know, just go to different websites, uh, figure out how to navigate, you know, just the different tools. Uh, for your listeners, some people might remember like the pinball game that used to come on like old Windows computers. Um, used to play that uh, quite a bit. Then oftentimes I, I was on LimeWire. I was uh, I don't know if you know what LimeWire is. You know what LimeWire is? No, I, just, I don't know what that is. <laughs> okay, so LimeWire is back in my day. It's a uh, it was a site or not a site, but it was a app that we could use on computers to basically download music, music and movies and stuff. Um, illegally <laughs> so uh that's that we used to yeah sometimes you get like a virus on a computer from downloading something that said it was like uh you know it could have been like a rap cd or something like that but it really wasn't and so uh i always had to figure out how to you know get rid of those viruses before my mom found out so uh just trial and error figuring it out it kind of just made me kind of obsessed with technology uh, and i kind of just fell into it i actually started out in sales uh out of college um, but then, um, you know, technology was still kind of on the forefront of my brain. Um, so what I would do, uh, or what, what I did do is, uh, there was an opportunity at the job that I had right out of college, um, to kind of shadow the IT department. Um, so I actually transitioned to a position there and then, uh, you know, that's how it all began. I started out help desk and then, Started, got my master's degree, I saw the security is going to be needed, and then I just fell into it, and then I was really good at it, and now I'm here talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's real, that's a real cool. I had a, I had another question was, uh, you know, do you have any advice for, like, people, like, for the minorities, and, like, people like me and you who, like, are trying to go into these, like, fields of technology, which, you know, sometimes there are biases which can't really yeah. do it, like, you can't really change that, but, like, any advice for like the people who are listening and like in general about like how people as like minorities, we can still achieve like high levels of success. Yeah, definitely. Um, one thing I always was tell people is don't compromise your morals of who you are just for the sake of business. Um, that's one thing I would say, uh, you know, you will be put into potentially put into positions where, uh, you will have to act really professional, but, you know, obviously, you know, someone has stepped out of a professionalism for the sake of, you know, just their own personal bias. Okay. And, you know, obviously, you know, you're, you're always going to be spotlighted when you're a minority and a predominantly, uh, you know, we'll just go ahead and say a predominantly white field. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the spotlight is always going to be on you. People are always waiting on you to kind of react. Um, you know, do things that they already predict that you're going to do. Um, so it's not up to you to change the narrative. It's up to them to kind of, you know, change, you know, their opinion. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you always want to be professional at all times. Uh, but don't uh, don't really compromise yourself and who you are uh, for the sake of a job. Um, that's one thing that I would say. But I always uh, what I will always say is always keep tracking in a paper trail of things that occur. Uh, you know, if there are certain issues or things that potentially might impact you in the long run, you always want to keep note of everything. Mm -hmm. um, and then thirdly, what I would say is um, help somebody that looks like you. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you kind of want to pay it forward always. So someone kind of, you know, helped you out to get into a position. You kind of want to do that to someone else that looks like you as well, too. Um you know, because you want to, you want to change this the landscape. You want to, you want more people that look like you to come into uh, this field and this space. Uh, so those are those are primarily the three things that I would say. That was some that was wonder, wonderful advice. I I agree that like you know we have to pay it forward, like because like if we don't, then we kind of we can't like foster the change in yeah society, sure. which is you got the right idea, man. Yeah. Yep. Well, I had like a few quite a question related to like. Previous job experience, like I know you worked at like State Farm and Verizon. Did, were there any like uh -huh. like experiences in there that really like that you gained something from like and any like 
I guess like advice or like lessons you took away from any of those jobs that you like briefly want to talk about? Yeah, uh, I think State Farm, I really got a lot of, uh, you know, true corporate experience there. Um, I would say uh, there's some super high IQ people in this field. Um, and you never want to feel, people always say imposter syndrome, mm-hmm. you never want to feel incompetent. Uh, so in the way for, for myself, what I did to not feel incompetent was to ask so many questions that people just were like, you know, <laughs> not really tired of me asking questions, but more so that they knew that I was always going to ask questions. You want to be mm-hmm. the person that's inquisitive if you don't know something, mm-hmm. um, especially if it's a new field and you feel like, um, you know, people are smarter than you because you never want to be the smartest mm-hmm. person in the room. Like that's that's just a given. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, you'll come across that you uh, a lot in this space is uh, you probably won't be the smartest in the room. Uh, but you always want to be the most inquisitive person because uh, if, even if the most minor thing doesn't make sense to you, um, it shows that you're being attentive. Uh, and it also shows that you are interested in actually the work that's being done. Um, so people will uh, look towards you to kind of be involved in more projects in the future, uh, which helps to you know stand out uh, a lot more um, in the future. So. Uh, that's something that I learned in a corporate space. Um, also, um, what I would say is, you know, uh, build relationships. Uh, soft skills take you a long way in this field. Uh, a lot of people in this field are kind of introverted. Um, they don't really, you know, have really good soft skills. Soft skills meaning know how to hold conversations, know how to, you know, talk in a way that's understandable, break down technical things into a lamest terms way because you'll be speaking to executives a lot. Um, so you generally want to uh, work on your soft skills, work on your speaking ability a lot. Uh, you also want to work on your writing skills. Uh, knowing how to document uh, things can take you so much farther than anybody else uh, on the team. Uh, knowing how to adequately, adic- adequately um, you know, write down processes mm-hmm. makes you an engineer. Knowing how to build out processes makes you an engineer. So uh, the, I feel like those things know how to speak well, know how to write well, um, and practicing those things and asking a lot of questions. Those are some of the things that I learned, uh, you know, from State Farm. And, you know, I worked with some awesome people at both Verizon and State Farm, uh, and they kind of helped and shape and hone uh, my, those abilities that I currently have today. I had um, uh, like a little side question. Uh, how do you, how do you, how would you recommend, like, I guess, like building relationships with like other people because i know like it kind of can get awkward and like mm-hmm. like it really isn't like taught that much in school i guess like you kind of uh-huh. in school you're kind of like with your close friends you kind of don't intermingle right. that much with the people mm-hmm. around you so like any advice because like when you go into a job you're definitely going to be working with people that you really don't know at all yeah um find a common ground uh you know, one thing that I've always noticed is that people like to talk about themselves mm-hmm. um, in corporate environments. People have lives outside of work. Um, so it goes back to my point about asking questions, you know, from a obviously you want to ask questions mm-hmm. about work that you're doing, but ask people questions about their life um, and let them give them opportunity to kind of talk to you. Um, vulnerability opens up for vulnerability. So mm-hmm. when people kind of open up to you, you kind of want to, you know, sometimes share uh, some stuff with them as well too, but people generally, the human, the human people, uh, they lo- or humans in general, they love talking about themselves. Uh, so asking questions, building those relationships, and remembering stuff that people tell you. So if someone tells you about like a dog that just got, and a year later, or you haven't, you, you don't see him for a few months, and you remember that one fact that they told you about their dog, you want to ask them. You know, that's a talking point that you can bring up to them, and you know that that'll help you. You know, they'll be an ally for you. Um, then I'll also, you know, assist you in certain things down the line, uh, due to the fact that you all have that relationship and you asked about their dog, uh, from like eight months ago, <laughs> that was a puppy. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, stuff like that, it, it matters, um, you know, when you're navigating a corporate space. I had, I had another question. So I want to ask like, you know, how do you, how do you really like, not like, you know, like people will probably when you once you come into a new space as like a new person like just out of college people will probably judge you in some way how do you like get that like 
like the you know thoughts of other people out of your head like as like a you might be a more minority and people might think of you some different way you might be like completely new to the the field and some people might think of you some way like like, um being a minority or being new to the field or both both like anything pretty much like as a new person um i think that's that's an imposter syndrome Mm -hmm. so that's uh you kind of just gotta overcome that by you know counting your small wins is one thing that i always do when i feel like i'm not being successful at my job or you know i might have like an off week where you know i didn't execute at a high level as I wanted to, uh, I, I count my small wins. Um, and that helps me to kind of, you know, be confident in myself as well as my role. I think that uh, that helps out quite a bit. That's what I do personally. Everyone might have different, uh, you know, methods, but counting your small wins is a super important key um, because it helps define, you know, uh, you know, the work that you're doing, uh, your, um, your value to the company um, and you know the outside noise generally can't really determine your value that you might have to a company I mean it can determine mm-hmm. your you know your trajectory because you know but that's all that's executives managers things of that nature uh, but you shouldn't really care too much about you know other people's opinions you, we always talk about um, you know I've been hearing this term for, mm-hmm. for years about your brand at a company mm-hmm. or at your job you want your brand to always be you know, positive. You want your brand to be something that people be like, when they think about you, they're like, okay, this person's a hard worker. This person knows what he's talking about. Um, they're reliable. Um, you know, I can go to this person and they can kind of tell me, you know, give me solutions to the issue that I might be having. You want to be resourceful. Uh, so you want your brand to be in that realm and, you know, you know, building your brand around that and also counting your small wins helps you to, you know, kind of, navigate those uh impressions those bad impressions that people might have uh, early on i had one last question um as a final mm-hmm. question so my question was when you look back at your journey to like whoever you are as a person is there any point in your life where you see like you see as like that was a defining moment or something that you wish you had done beforehand like or like something that you wish that you could have done different like anything that you look back and reflect reflect upon um, I wish I was started programming a lot earlier. Um, I wish I took the time out and, you know, it could have been just been like the opportunities that I was given at the moment. Um, I wish my parents probably, uh, and I wish they put, would have put me into programming stuff a lot earlier. Um, that's one thing. Um, outside of that, nah, uh, that's, 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 that's always been, that's a technical you know, hurdle that's a, that's been in my career a little bit is just you know catching up you know with people that have been programming for years and years and years. Um, you know, I've been programming or you know doing minor minor projects and stuff for I don't know maybe like five years, five six years. And some people have been doing it for ten plus, uh, and I think it would have it would have taken me a lot farther in my career by now as well. Um, I think that's pretty much it. I, my life has been great, man. Mm-hmm. I don't really have any regrets um, or anything that I would change, really. I, I kind of like to hear because, you know, like a bunch of like having no regrets is kind of, I feel like yeah. it's such a good feeling. Like, For sure. Definitely. If you don't have like, you don't have any stress, you're like happy in life. But I just, I, I, that's really the final question. I really want to thank you uh-huh. for uh, your awesome, time man. in general. Like it was really yeah. like some great advice, really. That's it for today's podcast. Again, if you enjoyed this episode, make sure to follow us on wherever you get your podcast. And if you'd like to support us even more, make sure to rate us wherever you get your podcast. Until then, we look forward to seeing you in a future podcast very, very soon.